Hello, I'm Ben Wattenberg. Hope for peace in the Middle East has once again been shaken by violence. Can peace still prevail, or was the process destined to collapse? Joining us to sort through the conflict and consensus are Gene Kirkpatrick, senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and author of The Withering Away of the Totalitarian State and Other Surprises. Robert Satloff, executive director of the Washington Institute for Near East Policy and author of From Abdullah to Hussein, Jordan in Transition. Peter Rodman, director of national security programs at the Nixon Center for Peace and Freedom and author of more Precious Than Peace, The Cold War, and The Struggle for the Third World, and Jerome Siegel, research scholar at the Center for International and Security Studies at the University of Maryland, and co-author of the study, The Status of Jerusalem in the Eyes of Israeli Jews. The topic before this house, Is Peace Plausible? This week on Think Tank. Four years ago, on the lawn of the White House, Israel and the Palestine Liberation Organization, the PLO, signed an agreement negotiated in secret in Oslo. It was hailed as the biggest breakthrough in the Middle East since Egypt and Israel made peace 20 years earlier. The Oslo Agreement, sealed with a handshake, brought great hope and then great disappointment. The essence of the agreement was simple land for peace. If the PLO ended its domestic war against Israel, the Intifada, Israel would yield the Gaza Strip and part of the West Bank to a new Palestinian authority headed by Yasser Arafat. In theory, this agreement was to end the struggle that had lasted for generations. Has that happened? In the four years since Oslo, Israel has undergone vast political change, but nonetheless, has ceded some land. The Palestinian Authority has delivered some civil order. But, say observers, the PLO has not yet removed from its charter the clause calling for the destruction of Israel. This and recent violence, which we will get to later, has led some to ask the haunting question, is peace plausible? Lady and gentlemen, thank you for joining us. Let's go around the room quickly with that simple haunting question in the Middle East is peace plausible? Gene. Well, I think peace is possible, but not probable, until there is democracy in the area, more democracy in the surrounding states than now exists. Peter Rodman. Well, I think paradoxically, despite all the fireworks, I think the two sides are closer to a definitive negotiation and a final resolution than they have ever been. Okay, uh, Robert Satloff. I think peace is a reasonable objective, but I think it's going to take a lot longer than the original Oslo uh, founders thought it would take. Jerry Siegel, University of Maryland. I think we had a much better shot at peace uh, before the last Israeli elections. Uh, with uh, Benjamin Netanyahu now as Prime Minister of Israel, I think we have significantly uh, diminished likelihood of peace between Israel and the Palestinians. I don't agree with Jerry. I think that uh, the Netanyahu election is just one piece of a landscape that we've seen over the last couple of years. I mean, we had the huge series of terrorist attacks in February and March when there was a labor government. Uh, we had uh, um, the breakdown in the negotiations with Syria when there was a labor government. I don't see the Netanyahu election as being the pivotal event. It's a piece of the landscape but it isn't uh, the one event that changed everything. I think Likud has evolved in an extraordinary fashion over the last year. The Prime this Minister is, uh, has... The Prime Benjamin Minister Netanyahu's, Netanyahu's party, right? party. Netanyahu is on record now, at least through his spokesman, as saying he concedes the idea of a Palestinian state. And the only issue left is the extent of it, geographic extent, and some of its powers. I think any Israeli government would insist on some limitations of its powers, particularly in the, na in the security area. So I think the Likud has evolved. I think there is a, a national consensus in Israel, which is one of the, the basic preconditions of a, a serious negotiation on the ultimate questions. I don't think there's consensus anywhere, frankly. There's always this focus on, you know, is it Netanyahu? What have the Israelis not done? 
let's look at what the PLO hasn't done. You know, let's look at what you mentioned at the, at the beginning. That PLO, after having agreed to r renounce the covenant, which calls for the destruction mm -hmm. of Israel in no uncertain terms, and the return of refugees and a variety of other uh, such uh, factors that are incompatible with the survival of the state of Israel, has taken no action on the renunciation of the covenant. One of the ironies that what's happening now is that Labour and Likud have had a vigorous negotiation amongst themselves, and they're getting closer to each other. But you don't have on the other side one public utterance public utterance. And for me, after studying the Arab world for quite a long time, it's what people say in public is much more important than what they say in private. Actually, it's the same in America and in Israel. Um, there's not been one public utterance of a move toward a consensus number. So we have... On, I, on, the, Palestinian think, on the Palestinian side. side. So while Peter's point is right, that you do have labor and Likud reaching a sort of consensus, you don't have any public sign of a consensus moving from the Palestinian side. So that's why I mean, I, I think that peace is plausible, but it's going to take a lot longer until we have that movement well, on the Palestinian side. Well, I agree with, I agree I with Rob. I, I agree with Rob. I think, obviously, the, I mean, the, the Oslo deadlines are arbitrary and they're in, you know, wildly optimistic. I'm, what I'm seeing, I'm taking a long-term perspective. What I see is the peace is gradually falling into place. And I think it is, it is interesting to me that you have Likud and the PLO as the interlocutors. I mean, five years ago, this was inconceivable. And neither side would like, really likes the other one. I mean, the PLO would rather have labor to talk to, and, and Likud would rather have some tamer group of Palestinians. But these, in a sense, these are the two core elements that, that need to be talking to each other, and, and the constituencies that can deliver uh, on a deal. I think the pieces are starting to fall into place. Okay, that uh, brings us to some recent events. Last month, Israel began construction of settlements in Har Choma, a vacant stretch of land in South Jerusalem. The construction sparked Palestinian protests and violence, including a bombing in Tel Aviv. Israel maintains that Jerusalem, the historic capital of Israel, was never part of earlier agreements, and so there is nothing wrong with building there. Arafat claims the bombings were acts of independent terrorists and that Jerusalem is also the intended capital of an independent Palestine. Israel asserts that Arafat gave the terrorists a green light. Oh, so what is, just to, that's well, there's just two, to catch us there up are two on this. separate so what, issues of violence. I think the two somewhat separate issues. One is whether the PLO, uh, can we hold the PLO accountable for Hamas? And I think it has to be accountable for Hamas. The second issue is, is mob no violence. Deal. I mean, right. The second issue is mob violence and whether the PLO or the, the Palestinian Authority kind of gives the green light to the crowd to stir up trouble and throw rocks and you know mob violence whenever there's an impasse in the negotiations and the Palestinians have some grievance about the Israeli mm -hmm. negotiating positions. I think both of those are unacceptable. And I think one of the obstacles now in the negotiation is clearly that that the Palestinians are being indulged, they're, they're being allowed to get away with, I think, what is totally unacceptable tactics, uh, and this will become a habit, it'll become a strategy if, if they get away with the tactics of using, they're supposed to have renounced violence unconditionally as part of Oslo, and if they're still using violence one way or another as a tactic, as a weapon, then that is one of the, one of the most serious flaws or obstacles in did, the whole did, deal. Did Arafat yeah, give the green me, light? First of all, on the, on the issue of violence, I think we have to make a, a, a very important distinction between terrorism and other forms of violence. Uh, ter terrorism has always been the, uh, not just morally unacceptable, but it's also, in my judgment, been among the stupidest things that the Palestinians have done and has, and has, and has held them back. On the other hand, um, what we, what's going on with Har Homa, it's, it, it's true that the Oslo Accord did not prohibit Israel explicitly from building in Har Homa. It's also the case that the Oslo Accord agreed that Jerusalem would be up for negotiation as part of the final status negotiations, which haven't started yet. From a Palestinian point of view, if Israel starts constructing in some of the parts of Jerusalem that now remain open, such as the Har Homa area, if it starts constructing massive Jewish neighborhoods in there, what it's doing is it's unilaterally foreclosing the possibility that Israel agreed to 
in Oslo, which is to negotiate Jerusalem. So from a Palestinian point of view, what the construction of Harhoma is, is a violation of the spirit of the accord. This is just ridiculous, I think. But, but one thing that the Israelis and that Netanyahu proposed, and very quickly, after the withdrawal from Hebron, was to move to final status negotiations. One of the interesting characteristics of the Oslo Accords is that they do not, uh, and of the peace process, if you will, is that it proposes no ends. It proposes a series of Israeli withdrawals and of Israeli renunciations and no end. The only end that is, you know, that uh, is one sort of one slice. It reminds me of Lenin's old salami slices, right. you know. You get one slice and then you get another slice. Well, and but there was going to be a, a final status agreement. Well, except that it didn't say when the final status negotiations even would begin. It did. And Netanyahu proposed that the final state that they go immediately to final status negotiations. And our Arafat has an, simply rejected this proposal. If they went directly to final status mm -hmm. negotiations, then it would be possible to talk about what the final agreement would be, what percent. Would but be that's what Arab uh, Bob Salaf. I think what we're getting at is a basic fundamental problem in the core of the negotiating process mm -hmm. that Oslo had. Right. And it may not be insurmountable, but it's a basic problem. Israelis and Palestinians looked at the same piece of paper and saw different things. For Israelis, this was a commitment from the Palestinians to end violence and a promise in return of a process that would not provide any clear outcome. It was a promise of a process. Palestinians looked at this piece of paper and saw it as the unpalatable postponement of the inevitable creation of a Palestinian state in all of the West Bank and Gaza and Jerusalem. But now we're getting close to that end of that five-year period, and people let are, let are coming out with their desires for Jerusalem. Let, let, let me ask one, one question that, that kind of puzzled me. This panel has been artfully constructed to have give a full range of views beneath the rubric of, of the legitimacy of the state of Israel. Now you can argue about you know what its borders are and what the what kind of a Palestinian state or authority there will be but it, it does not include so-called rejectionists because we thought that would just be a food fight. Now what 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 is to prevent um, the following situation when, when a Let's say a Palestinian state is established. Yasser Arafat is elected democratically as president. They have a place at the United Nations. Everybody goes, uh, says, hooray. Uh, and, and then the rejectionists who are still within that new state of Palestine start taking out the salami knife again and say, aha, but we didn't get this and we're going to drop a bomb and we didn't get this and we're going to drop a bomb and then the Israelis give them a slice of salami, maybe and maybe not. And then they say, but we, I mean, ultimately, after all, there are, I don't know, a majority or not, but lots and lots of Palestinians who still would like to drive Israel into the sea. What, what is to give, how do you solve that? If, if, I assume you're not saying, what's the, to prevent them from saying it? If they say it, No, fine. I didn't say but saying, saying it, doing it. What you're saying it. is that, it, right. is that if a Palestinian state comes into existence and it serves as a basis for further attacks on Israel, what, what Israel will do, and this is what will prevent right. it, is that Israel will respond militarily. And when you're dealing in a state-to-state -state situation, mm -hmm. in fact, where Israel doesn't have responsibility for a people that's under its, its occupation, in fact, Israel will have a much freer hand to do this. Right, they would have, the to, end of the day, have to reoccupy day, Palestine. Yeah, Wouldn't that be a great solution? Kerry's right I mean, in saying Well, that. In, in fact, from, the, from a right-wing point of view, in fact, it will be a war situation. A, a war situation will be the one situation in which just as but, but Palestinians... Arafat, Arafat or whoever the PLO is going to say, I, gee, I was independent actors. You know, you didn't give us enough. We that told you that. That won't cut any. That won't cut any water when there's an independent Palestinian state, and it shouldn't. An independent Palestinian state will be brought to conform to the same norms that, that, that occur in the rest of the world. If you use your state as a Peter, launching pad, well, just to say, Israel, Israel has a long tradition of responding militarily to cross-border attacks. I mean, going back to the 50s. So, I mean, this is. If you get a state, I mean, I'm willing to concede this principle that if there's a state, it's a, it's, the state is very, going to be very vulnerable, and Israel will have a lot of leverage over a Palestinian state. And, you know, there'll be porous borders, and this won't be all that manageable. But I think the, 
a Palestinian state that makes peace with Israel and accepts certain borders, I think the political context changes too. I think it strengthens Israel's position if there's a serious violation of it. I mean, this is all kind of abstract now because they're not at that point. The Palestinians were interested for a long time in getting to final status. What they're not interested in is going to final status without getting some of the things that they were promised as part of the interim agreement. Now, what they, what they were promised as part of the interim agreement were three withdrawals. They, were let, they maybe led themselves to believe, maybe they were led to believe that those withdrawals would, be, would, would cover most of the West Bank and Gaza. The United States has talked about 50%. Okay, if Netanyahu is prepared to withdraw from a, what it would take, another 21% to get to the 51% uh, withdrawal from the West Bank, be, I would imagine that you could start final status negotiations right now. Well, they would what the Palestinians don't want to do is abandon that. They were never promised any of this. And I, I think the interim stuff is, is in the way. I think the problem is, is they weren't promised it's not final withdrawals. status. Is a, a Likud government is not going to show its cards in the interim step. So I'm, I'm an advocate of moving directly to final status and also disposing of these other incremental issues. A labor government designed this Oslo procedure because for a labor government, it, the smart thing to do was to sneak up on final, final territorial partition in the guise of interim steps. But for Likud, the, the logic doesn't work. I mean, Oslo has come to a dead end. The, 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 the problem process, now in the negotiation is Oslo process, has run out should, of should, should the United yeah. States get more involved? Uh, yeah. Well, the United States uh, is involved. Bill Clinton mm -hmm. is, uh, you know, views this as a personal achievement, the Oslo process with Yitzhak Rabin, and doesn't want to see it collapse. The question right now is, should Madeleine Albright go out to the region and try to put pieces back together? Should Bill Clinton invite them to Washington? I think at the moment, right now, it's probably not the right idea. Things aren't particularly ripe for a huge American investment right now. Um, Israel is dealing with this domestic political scandal, uh, which hasn't played itself out yet fully, although it looks like Netanyahu has been cleared. With the Palestinians, I don't think there's yet um, clarity on whether they will have security cooperation with Israel. These are all minute on the ground tactical issues. At the mo when the moment is ripe, the United States should get involved Does because we have come up with a big yellow R and say ripe. Yeah, How do you actually, know whether you it's do. ripe if you don't. You, 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 you do can it. tell um, when the parties have some basic things back in order. I mean, we have, a, we have an agreement on the ground about how the two police forces are supposed to work with each other. We have an agreement on the ground about economics. We have an agreement on, on movement of people. When they begin to put some of the basic building blocks back together and they're ready for a political overlay, then the United States comes in and we try to make the final status talks meaningful and we try to make them work. I think it's far too sanguine, the, the discussion here. What, what nobody is really talking about, I guess, is, is what I would call the abyss. And I think we got, we got a sense of that when we saw what happened after the uh, Temple Mount Tunnel incident, when there were not only a question of, uh, of riots, but we basically saw Palestinian police, Palestinian soldiers turning their guns against Israelis. And it was, it was, it was, it was the, an inkling of what could happen if this, if this breaks down, it's not just a question of the return of the intifada that we're talking about, it's the return of a conflict at a much higher level of violence therefore and a much what? more violent therefore response. What? Therefore, at least from the point of view of the United States, we cannot, we cannot sit around and let things take, take their course. The name of the game is compromise, it's, so we don't know what it's going to look like. This is unlike any other previous Arab-Israeli negotiation. When you had the Syria, we had the Egyptians, Sorry. you had the Jordanians, Sorry. you had a piece of land and an ex a clear piece of land like That's the right. Sinai. That's in exchange, right. you had a clear piece and what it was going to be. Here you're talking about a piece of land that will be divided. This has never happened before in the history of Arab-Israeli negotiations, asking Arabs and Israelis to figure out how to divide wow. a piece of land that they both want. That's how Israel was created. Ah, but it was never done by negotiations. It was done by well, war. I mean, and so that's why actually, this is so it, difficult. It, it, the partial domestication of the PLO, a process which is not yet adequately, you know, completed. That's, that's where we are at this stage. You don't mean domestication, it, 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 though. I mean, this is, this is the problem. Look, look there's only, there only is negotiations because there was an intifada. It's not the case that we ended up with negotiations between Israel and the Palestinians out of the goodness of the heart of, 
of the Israelis. It was basically an indigenous revolt against the occupation and a decision on the part of the Israeli government that it wasn't prepared to pay the price for continuing the occupation. But also the collapse now, if, of the me, Soviet me, Union me just, and the just, weakening of the PLO let me, let me, let through let me, let me a series let me, of other events. Let me just events. finish That's this. Right. Let me just, let me just finish this. Look, lost its whole look, basis of support. If in fact, with the if in fact, of the Soviet Union. if in fact yeah. the process disappears, or if we get into final status negotiations and those negotiations deadlock within a context in which we're not dealing with a labor government, in which we're dealing with a Likud government that is perceived by the Palestinians as not being serious about a Palestinian state, not being serious about a real withdrawal from the West Bank, then the Palestinians have nowhere to go except back to violence. Either they can accept that or they'll go back to violence. Anybody who thinks that they won't go back to violence is kidding themselves. The violence that will come next time on both sides will be so much worse than anything that we've seen, and it will spill over. It'll spill over into, into Israeli-Egyptian relationships. Look, and, it's and already that's, spilled that's over. It's already spilled over because Yasser Arafat, the moment that he encountered a frustration in dealing with Israel, called on all the Arab states in the region, and the leaders of the Arab states in the region you know, met to talk about uh, unity in the face of this challenge. And I think it's a very bad mistake to ever discuss the Israeli PLO relationship without taking into account continually the attitudes and behavior of other of Israel's neighbors. And I think, for example, of Syria and Assad. I think of Saddam Hussein and Iraq. I think of Iran and its various uh, mullahs. Um, and the fact that Israel has no ally in the region at all who, uh, you know, on whom it could count not to, simp not to become hostile in case uh, hostilities broke out. I, I want to go to two general questions and we're, we're rapidly running out of time. Mm -hmm. uh, first one, why should America care about all this? In 1997, we care for, for two main reasons. Uh, one, we care about Israel, about Israel's security, about uh, Israel's survival, about uh, the relationship between the two parties. We also care because the Arab-Israeli conflict has a way of infecting relations throughout the entire region. Um, it has a way of souring or advancing America's interests in the Persian Gulf, interests with our modern Arab allies. In the old days, we used to have the big reason because of the Soviets. I understand that. But that's gone now. So, you know, overall, there's, there's, there's less of a, a national security immediate threat but we care because the region matters to us strategically, politically, and economically. Do you get a sense that in the near to intermediate term future, we may end up talking about this problem in the past tense? So that we really, let's say five to ten years, you may have a deal that sticks and the thing will be over after a century? I think five to ten years, yes. Sure. Five to ten years, no, but my grandchildren will only read about this in history books. We may have, I think we, I think we will have a, a Palestinian state, we will have a peace treaty within, within 10 years. The, the, the open issue, and it's going to be remain permanently open, is whether or not you have more than a peace treaty, whether or not you have genuine and lasting peace. And that, that's a question, basically, of each generation continuing to struggle for it, especially here. I'm a real optimist. I think as Israel's neighbors, as, as, you know, as the Palestinians and Syrians, and Iraqis and Iranians become democratic and pluralist. There will be, a, in fact, a peace in the region. I believe that much as the Soviet Union was sort of determined to make war, making war, eliminating capitalism was its business, so are the people in Israel's immediate neighborhood determined to eliminate the state of Israel. But I think those people are uh, already sort of out of date and that they will be replaced by people who are, are in fact ready to live at peace in democratic plural state. And then there will be peace, prosperity, and a, and a new Middle East. As she right, I, I, just right. to close this out, let me say that I also am somewhat optimistic on perhaps somewhat other grounds that, that uh, Israel has really never been in as strong a position as it is now. I mean, the Soviet Union is out of business. They've had a huge demographic uh, 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 immigration coming in from the Soviet Union. Uh, Saddam Hussein is out of business. 
Uh, the economy is doing very well. There's global trade uh, now. They really have the, uh, for the first time in a long time, uh, the price of oil is way down. They have the ability uh, to make a deal from a position of strength. That is my view. Uh, thank you, Gene Kirkpatrick, Robert Satloff, Peter Rodman, Jerome Siegel, and thank you. For Think Tank, I'm Ben Wattenberg. We at Think Tank depend on your views to make our show better. Please send your questions and comments to New River Media, 1150 17th Street Northwest, Washington, D.C., 20036. Or email us at thinktank at pbs.org. To learn more about Think Tank, visit PBS online at www.pbs.org. And please let us know where you watch Think Tank. This has been a production of BJW Incorporated in association with New River Media, which are solely responsible for its content.